you have been raising the prices and it had almost no impact on win rate, churn. So I want to talk about this. I've done it several times and it's not just art, you can do it as a science. How do you actually even remark that prices hasn't been set the right way? I just ask various salespeople to give me a pitch. If they start talking about price in the, in the first 10 minutes, I know there is an issue. So what are your best practices when it comes to that based on your experience? It doesn't have to be money, but you ask something back. Because the moment you start giving discount without any consequences, they, they're going to keep on asking. I will happily participate and double my price and still win. The key to all of that is basically... Today, I'm excited to bring to you Peter Gerard. Peter has just finished his mission at Expensia as CRO. And before that, he has held several leadership positions such as CEO of Mobile Expense, uh, Chief Banking Officer at Isabel Group and Head of Sales at Warline, among others. So I asked Peter if there is one thing, like one secret that you know other CROs would want to know as well, what would that be? And his answer, very simple, I think we should talk pricing, Dylan. So pricing it is, but pricing is such a sensitive concept, right? Like as a sales rep, we always get nervous when we got to talk pricing, uh, our prices gets compared to these of the competitors. We, I mean, discounts are being asked, right? We need to do the commercial gestures. However, Peter at multiple occasions actually raised prices and sometimes even times two. And that's while maintaining the same ring weight and churn. Therefore, in today's interviews, we are exploring the concept of pricing in depth. We are talking about the step-by-step -step approach in raising prices, how to get to the right pr pricing in the first place. And we also touch on concepts such as price discrimination and discounting. And with that, please enjoy my conversation with Peter. Now, Peter, um, and maybe to all the sales leaders that haven't tweaked their prices for a long time, I, need to, I think they need to listen up. Because Peter, in the preparation call, you mentioned that at multiple occasions, not only one, but multiple occasions, you have been raising the prices by significant percent. I think you mentioned like 50 to 100%. Yep. And it had almost no impact on win rate, churn. It helped the efficiency of the sales team uh, in terms of payback of the CAC and, and, and stuff like that. So I want to talk about this. So to kick up this conversation, can you briefly share your experiences related to this topic? Keep it short for now, but later we'll go more in depth about it. Yeah, I, I think the the most, um, I would say, uh, complete example uh, would be at Mobile Expense. Uh, that's a few years ago. And there was a strong belief that we won deals based on the price. Um and when we looked at that, that was not the case. We doubled the list price. We increased the price for existing customers without any churn. Uh, we also switched from a, a payment in arrears to an upfront payment, which was tremendous for the cash flow. And I think the, the key to all of that is basically understanding who your customers are and why they choose your product. And I've done that at Mobile Expense. I've done that at other companies. Um, and it's something which scares typically sales leaders. Um, but then again, I've done it, I've done it several times and I think there is a recipe if you want, uh, to do that. Uh, it's, it's not just art. You can do it as a science. Love it. We'll talk about that recipe, but can you maybe start explaining or at least from your experience? How come that the pricing was not set right in the first place? What are people doing wrong when it comes to pricing in the first place? Well, in, in my experience, and especially if you have a, a tech-led company, so a company very much focused on the product or on, on SaaS and the service, um, your first customers you get, I wouldn't call it by accident, but you do whatever it takes. You take a nice, or you hope it is, a nice markup on your cost. Uh, and that sets a kind of, you know, this is the price. What also happens maybe at a bit later stage is that um, companies start looking around for like, what's the price of a similar product or a similar service? Um, but then again, that can be very dangerous because you could say that a, um, 
Fiat 500 is a car and a, you know, a Mercedes E or, or a Porsche, Porsche is a car, you know, is it the same? Well, kind of, but you know, they don't copy each other's price. So what happens is that, um, the first deals kind of set the price. Sometimes there is a look at, you know, what is the market offering, but not too detailed. And that kind of sets the mentality to, or, or, or the idea that this is the price without really understanding who buys the product, for what reason, what are the benefits. And it's a kind of, it, it becomes like, we've always done it like this. And the moment you want to change it, uh, and I've done this several times, you get almost a revolt from the salespeople. We will lose all our deals now. You know, the win rate will, will come totally crash. Uh, you know, we will get kicked out in the first round with a customer. And that's never the case. So, you know, it's, it's, it's become a habit. I would say that this is the price. And I think this is especially true for companies which are still going through the, you know, product market fit, if you want to call it like that. Um, because if you really can articulate the value that you bring to a customer, you can talk about that. And if you don't know the value you're bringing, you're going to talk about features and cost, but not about the value you can bring. So basically, a lot of, call it startups, scale-ups, and, and even bigger companies don't really understand the benefit for their customer, and they've priced because they've always priced like this. I love that. I love that. I've never heard the definition of product market fit in terms of having the right pricing because you know the value that you offer, but I like it because it, I feel like this is so true. So maybe we should start in it about how can someone who is listening to this figure out if their pricing is completely wrong or right? Like you mentioned, you have to understand the customer, you have to understand the value, but how would you, how would you approach this? There are a couple of things you can do. <clears throat> Uh, what I always like to do is get customer feedback and you need to talk to a couple of customers and of course you're the supplier they're not going to tell you everything or not going to tell you your prices are too low but it will give you a first idea of you know why customers work with you um, if you have the available funds and that's, that's especially true in a startup uh, you know if you can hire a, a, a neutral consultant who then and, and if you don't have the money work with a business school you know write out a uh, a master thesis thing and then the students will do it for you and you know it's even better because everybody everybody loves to talk to students um but get a neutral party to interview customers and validate your assumptions and what i've done a couple of times is where they you know because you've talked to customers, you kind of have an idea of what's important. You ask them to rank, you know, why did they choose you, you know, from number one to number 10. Uh, and I've done this several times now, and uh, pricing has never been in the top five. So, which is already like an indication like, oops, you know, they're looking for something else. Of course, if your price is double of the competitor, maybe you know, they will look at price, but... Um, what's also uh, nice to do is ask them like what were your criteria before you made a choice and then afterwards you know on which ones did we score the best uh, so that's one thing to do that is really and it takes some time you know and this takes weeks or months because you need to contact the customers you need to convince them you need to have that consultant you need to get the feedback you need to consolidate it but it will give you a very very solid basis if you don't have that time uh, what I've done is uh, I'm not going to name the company but at one company um, when I joined we were selling uh, the product in Germany uh, and the installation so with SaaS some SaaS products have uh, you know an implementation project I don't know that sales guy was selling at 1000 euro per person day and I told him that's too cheap for Germany Oh, no, 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 it's always been like that. Okay, you know what? Your next deal, you go in for 1,200. And he was, he thought I was crazy. But we won that deal. And we won the next deal. I said, okay, you know what? 
Now you go for 1,300. Yeah, 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 let's try. And we won that. Go for 1,400. We did that. And I didn't have to convince him. He did it in himself. He raised it to 1,500 euro a day. So, <laughs> you know, and we still, nobody was complaining. Now, um, that's partly because I knew the German market for that product and I knew what, what could be acceptable. Uh, in a French market, that price would have been way too high, but, you know, you need to know your market a little bit. But one thing is you can talk to your customers and get a lot of feedback. And especially if you work with a neutral third party, they will tell you a lot of things that you didn't know and you can use that. And, you know, in parallel or afterwards, depending, just test it. You know, don't test it on your biggest prospects or whatever, but if you have a, a healthy enough pipe, try it for some customers or prospects. See what the, what the feedback is. You know, it's call it the agile way of doing sales. Test it. It works. Great. Let's go further. Oops. Nope. It blows up. Uh, that's not the right way to do it. So, um, honestly, as I said, it's, it's very basic. It's understanding what your customer values and testing it out. And that is yeah, as simple as that. Uh, there is a lot of reluctance or fear on, on doing this because what will happen and will the customers tell us? Of course they will tell us. I mean, look, people love to talk about themselves. If you get a consultant who is going to take some time and talk to the head of procurement or whoever is, is doing the contract at, at your customer side, and they can talk for an hour, about an hour how great they are and why they chose the project and what, why, what a big success your product is. Great, they will do that. And as I said, testing, you know, the biggest challenge you will have is your internal sales teams, which are like, you know, we can't increase with 10 or 20%. It's, uh, we're going to lose the deal. And once you have the first wins in, you know, that mindset will change. But it's mm -hmm. at, the, at, at the basis... It's quite simple. Hi guys, I quickly want to let you know that we are doubling down on this podcast and by so doing, we are looking for the better revenue stories out there. So if you like what you hear, please give it a like or a follow. It is a simple click on a button, but that click would mean the world to us. All right, let's go back. Yeah, I, I would think so too, but I can also imagine that indeed it still changed man management to a certain extent. So I can imagine that you still have a lot of stakeholders involved that might find it difficult to accept that change. Uh, let's may maybe to, to come back to what you said earlier, um, because I liked the fact that you said, I knew the German market, so I knew that prices could be higher in Germany than in France, for instance, uh, because this gives me like two interesting side notes. First, you were an expert in the German market, so maybe for everyone, that's not sure, not certain about their pricing. Maybe they should talk about an expert that know that prospect exactly. But then especially the second thing, knowing the prospect, um, do you also believe in price discrimination then? If, you know, for a certain prospect, sometimes uh, things are perceived more valuable than others, should you then price differently Absolutely. depending on who you're selling to? Well, it, it, it depends It depends on your, <clears throat> on your go-to-market and your sales model. If you have a one size fits all product you know and your your prices are listed on your website you know it's very difficult to do that or you have a very high list price and you can play with the discounts that that's one option uh, but if you have a product which needs to be customized or integrated what well, customized let's say configured not customized configured for your customer or there are you know there is some complexity in there Yes, of course you can. Of course you can. Um, so, as always, typically, you know, like for a bigger customer or a bigger deal, your unit price per user, per whatever, per document, per, per whatever is your metric, will be lower, most likely. And that is not always the case. Um, if I look to, for example, expense management, what I've seen is that if you have a local local deal <clears throat> meaning it's just france or just germany but well, germany is a bit different but just france or just belgium or just the netherlands there will be local champions who do just that country 
and they can go very aggressive in price and they typically will. And then the moment you need to have a bit of more complexity, you need to do like a multinational, uh, you know, multi-country deployment. Prices are actually higher for bigger deals, which is kind of strange that for a bigger deal, your unit price would be higher, but you're adding more value for the customer. So yes, price discrimination is very much about what is the value for the customer, you know, and is that a different value and can you tweak your offering uh, for that? But uh, absolutely, price discrimination, I think you, yeah, you should. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Let's talk maybe about how you come up with the value. You, you mentioned a couple of things earlier, like having good customer feedback, interviewing, re- ranking the different criteria on which they will uh, assess a certain vendor. Um, but is that enough? I'm, I can imagine that maybe you, you want to also, you know, in terms of messaging, phrase things differently. Maybe you want to put numbers also on uh, you know, you want to qualify the value somehow. So what are your best practices when it comes to that based on your experience? Well, there are a couple of things. <clears throat> I think the, the the feedback from customer interviews will tell you what customers really value, what they think you're very strong at, uh, which means that, you know, these are things that you should use in your marketing, your messaging, because... It's recognized by the market. You can get, you know, I would say easy, but more easily a testimonial from a customer on those topics because that's what they've said. So I think that's that's one part that's on your messaging, on your positioning. You know, uh, if, if what you say is recognized by the market and your existing customers, it makes your message much stronger. So that that is on purely the messaging. How do you get to the price or the value? Um, there are several ways. Um, I think you can try and come up with a, uh, a business case yourself, you know, the business case for the customer. Uh, if you're not sure and you have a friendly customer uh, or somebody, you know, you know, go with that draft Excel sheet and say like, hey, that's what we think is your business case. And I will say like, oh, you know, no, 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 no. This cost is way too low. This cost is way too high. You know, this is my business case. And, do you have to trust a customer at 100%? No, they're probably going to exaggerate a little bit the costs, but um, it will give you very good feedback like, hey, we think that this is your business case, it makes sense, and they will come back. Uh, what you can also do uh, is with customers, you know, you do a before and after testimonial. Of course, that is with a customer that is very happy with you. You have to agree upfront before you do uh, you know, before you start selling your product or delivering, it's like, hey, let's take a snapshot. What is the situation today? If it's, you know, accounts payable automation, uh, I spent, I don't know, my accountant spent, I have 10 accountants full-time working on this. Now, we implement your solution. Hey, I only need four accountants and the other six are doing more, I don't know what, interesting things. So I have a reduction in my cost of 60%. Cool. You know, and you... Actually, by by getting that information from your customer, you get a much better view on the value you can deliver. Now, ideally, you know, because um, this is a bit again, you know, you have the problem solution fit, you fix a problem, and that's you know, otherwise nobody would buy it. But then the product market fit is about okay, but what is important for customers? How do you scale it? Uh, if you understand your market, uh, you know. And, and don't shy away from, if, if your key customer persona is the CFO, talk to some CFOs or, you know, look in your network for a friendly CFO or even pay a guy for, a, you know, a small consulting thing like who has been a CFO or is the CFO and, and pay him a few days of consulting, whatever. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's not rocket science. It does require that you have a reasonable understanding of the cost or the driver or the business case at the customer side. And if you don't, make a stab in the dark, make something in Excel, go and talk to some friendly customers and they will, with pleasure, point out your issues like, no, 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 no. You know, this is too high, this is too low, you forgot this. And you can iterate. I mean, again, you can just ask customers. 
Um, it's it's as easy as that. I'm not saying that every customer will you know spend the time, but you ask ten, you will get feedback from two, and you can optimize. That's where it should start for sure. Um, would you say that when you're trying to somehow quantify the value, um, you brought some good examples of how you could do that, but or at least from your experience, and again, uh, could be different in, in many different contexts. But would you say that the value that you bring needs to be a certain multiplier of the price that you ask? Or should the value that you bring just be higher than, for example, the value that a competitor could bring? And then the stronger the business case, you know, the better your chances to win it? Or how do you try to look at that in terms of value versus pricing? I typically start talking about return on investment. Uh, and again, but this is SaaS, it could be in other things. You have an initial investment and then you have licenses or subscriptions that you pay. Um, typically, if you're in a software context, uh, people will look at the three-year <clears throat> ROI because you know, longer than three years is like an eternity in software. Calculate what is the ROI. Okay, there's an implementation project, there are the licenses. After three years, what is your return on investment? Another way to look at it is, is what is your payback time? You know, by when will you be with all the savings you've made or the additional sales that you've gained? If you look at, you know, things like Showpad, you know, it's not about cost saving, it's about increasing the sales. You know, when have you paid back your investment in the product? Um, and in software... I would say that's typically less than a year, sometimes less than six months. Uh, but hey, uh, if you calculate your ROI, and I've done that for, uh, you know, like at mobile expense or, or, or Expensia, uh, if you can say like, hey, your ROI after three years, your hard ROI, you know, which you can measure in cash because saving time for people is great, but then, you know, they're still on the payroll, they still cost money. Your hard ROI is, you know, 200% after three years. So you... Uh, you paid 100 and after three years you gained 300 so your net gain is you know 200 uh -huh. or um, in certain cases you know with specifically about expense management you know with, with uh, VAT recovery whatever it could be 700% after three years it's a no-brainer it's just a no-brainer you know you you talk about okay there is an investment and what do you get back and, and you know, if you're selling uh, like I used to do telecom equipment Maybe you need to look at an ROI on five years or 10 years, uh, but well, 10 years would be long. Um, I don't think anybody is doing it anymore, but if you would be selling nuclear plants, you're going to look at an ROI on 20 or 25 or 30 years. Uh, so you need to know, but you look at the ROI, like what is it that the customer has to pay? Or what are the savings or the additional revenue that they will generate? And you calculate your ROI. And that is, at the end of the day, something that every finance professional will look at. Um, and that's also where you can include your value because uh, the cost that can be different between you know you and your competitors but then you can say like hey we're very good at this which means that we will reduce the cost with so much and where competitors won't or we will do more sales and that's where you can really include your value your differentiators into the calculation and for me that's always worked on, on talking about ROI um, is the easiest one. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good one. Um, but still, like, for instance, if you have net value 200, um, I mean, let's say euros in, in, in this context, right? You had like 100 euro, 300% to 200 euro net value. Like, is it then just a game of negotiation of how much goes to you, the vendor, and how much goes to the customer? Or is there like, a guiding rule in, in, in splitting this? That depends. Uh, I would say that if you look at it from a business case perspective, you're typically talking to finance people. And, you know, if there is a 200% ROI, uh, they're going to be happy. I'm not sure they're going to negotiate a lot anymore uh, because that's a very nice return on investment. Uh, when you are faced with procurement people, yes. They will try, of course, to, you know, lower that and say like, hey, but the competitor is at this. And that's where I think your knowledge of the 
customer of the benefit of the business case is becoming important because you say, yeah, the other guys are 20% cheaper and, you know, we do this and this and this that they don't. So your benefit after three years will be like this. Um, so that's where you start defending your value. Um, and that, that requires, as I said, an understanding of the benefit you generate and, of course, also about the competition. Uh, right. Look, uh, I'm going to be... I did this kind of exercise uh, when I joined Mobile Expense and there was one particular customer where we had won against SAP Conquer, which was the biggest competitor. And their price was 10 times higher, not 10%, 10 times higher. So we went in with a price which was crazily low to the point that the customer actually doubted that we could do it for that price. Uh, you know, that means, and, and, and in this particular case, you know, we won at 300,000 euro a year. The others were at 3 million a year. We could have sold at two and a half million and have still have won the deal, right? So that that's a huge difference, uh, just based on the assumption that we need to be cheap, and you know we're we're a we're a scale up. We need to be cheap. Um, no, no, uh, and and don't don't be shy. Uh, also, when you talk to existing customers, I've had the case several times where the the prices were actually too low. Uh, where where the the gross margin was negative, so that forget HR, forget finance, forget all the overhead costs, just the pure production cost was higher than the price. Go back to a customer and say, like, you know what, I can't keep on doing this. I'm gonna double my price. Oh, I'm gonna do an RFQ. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. And it's like, yeah, I'm sorry, but then you have to do that, you know. And if you know the market, and if you know the prices on the market. I've had a couple of customers saying, like, we'll do for an RFQ, where I said, I'll happily participate and double my price and still win. One <laughs> of them actually did, one of them actually did, and we won that. Most others, you know, if, if they know and they look at it and they say, like, okay, if I have to go through the whole hassle of doing an RFQ, phasing out a solution, doing this, and actually, you're right, you know, the market price is much higher than what I'm paying you. I'm right. not going to say they're going to sign with a smile, but as I said, I had zero churn uh, in, in, in the various price increases I've done. So it's a lot about understanding the value and, of course, understanding the market price. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's a lot about daring to do it and having a discussion with your prospect or with your existing customer. It's and not easy, but, you know, the results are there. Hi guys, on May 16, 2024, we are hosting the We Are Sales Conference. Our ambition is to make this event Europe's best and largest conference on sales leadership, where we learn, discover, and debate cutting edge practices by leaders who have been there, done that. Again, May 16, 2024, make sure to block the date in your calendar. All right, let's go back. I mean, you also mentioned at the beginning that, um, you know, you also, you also mentioned that in the preparation, at least, that perception becomes reality. Absolutely. Uh, people always have, you know, had, yeah, those prices, those initial prices. So for them, it is what it is. They think they are worth that much. Uh, while that's not the case. And I definitely want to talk about the challenges, the hurdles of changing that belief, that mindset. Um, but first, I also want to understand, like, how do you then enter the company and observe and understand that prices are too low, are not set the right way. Are there maybe certain metrics or is it just by talking to customers? How do you actually even remark that prices hasn't been set the right way? It's uh, it's a couple of things. You, you try to understand, as I said, the business case for the customer. That's one thing. Um, secondly, but that that's more when you get a bit of experience in sales, I just ask various salespeople when I come in to give me a pitch. If they start talking about price in the f in the first 10 minutes, I know there is an issue because uh, in a good sales pitch, you create the value first and you only talk about price when the customer asks for it. You know, uh, you don't lead with the price. Um, so that gives me a pretty good indication. And then... Um, once you go a bit deeper in discussions, 
if you see that there are very few price discussions, you know, I made a proposal for a customer and they still want to clarify, can you do this or can you do that or fine, but nobody discusses the price. That means you're too cheap. That means you're too cheap. Um, and that's where you can start playing. And it, it depends, of course, on, on um, you need to convince your salespeople. Um, sometimes, and I've done that a couple of times, it's it's a leap of faith and they, there's almost a revolt. But when you're the CEO, you know, you, you, you can push that through and then they see the results. Typically, what you would want to do, and that's what I've done in a couple of cases, like I just said, like you start a thousand, you go to 1100, 1200, 1300, and you gradually increase. You create some quick wins. You create, um, you open the eyes of your salespeople. So it depends a bit on, on how convinced you are and how well you know the industry and how much time you have. Because sometimes, especially with a startup or scale up, you know, you have a need to hit your, uh, you know, your profitability or you have commitments to your investors. Um, but you can do it step by step by step. Like, hey, you know what? For all the new offers, we're going to increase the price with 10, 20, 25 percent. And let's see what happens to the win rate. And, you know, the win rate goes down tremendously. Oops, we have a problem. But that's something you can do. You know, like you evaluate after 10 deals or 15 deals. And that's maybe, I don't know what, a few weeks, maybe two months. So um, if you're sure, if you really know what you're doing, you can do a big bang. You will face a lot of resistance from your salespeople. And then you would need to be, you know, leading by example, you know, going with them to the to the customer meetings and making the offers. Um, if it's more like, I think there is something, but I don't know exactly what and how, do it gradually. It's, um, you know, uh, copying the page from the development guys. It's agile. Do something, test it. It works. Great. It doesn't work. Oops. Let's look again at, you know, what we need to change. So, uh, yes, there will be resistance. Uh, on the other hand, and I can say that because I've been in sales for a long time, salespeople are lazy. If they start to see that, hey, before I needed to sign 10 deals to hit my target, and with the increased prices, I only need to hit six. Hmm. You know, I like that. <laughs> let's let's go for let's go for that. So the moment you start showing that it is possible that they get a higher deal value, that actually they need to work less, or maybe they need to win less deals. Maybe they would need to work a little bit harder on each deal. Uh, but you know, winning six deals, hmm, yeah, I can do that. Winning ten, that might be difficult. But you know, winning six with a higher price, I still get my target. No. That's that's why I like sales because now you kind of translated what is the value for the sales rep. Absolutely, like the same the same principle, but like on another context. I love it. No, very yeah. good. No, and you also mentioned um, indeed, like you, I, I I liked the idea of listen to the sales calls, see if there are any obstacles and uh, any objections when prices have been shown. If none, um, then it might be an indication. And I in the preparation, I thought maybe a too high of a win rate could be also kind of an indicator of maybe prices are set too low. Uh, but I think looking at the objections is, is, is even better in this case. Look at, looking at objections is better or looking at, you know, uh, the questions asked by a customer. Uh, a high win rate, it could indicate that you're too low on price, but I've never looked at win rate as an indicator for that. Um, okay. Because, as I said, if you know what you're doing uh, and, and you, you know, you double the list price and, of course, you give some discount, but, and your win rate stays stable, yeah, then, you know, as I said, if, if price is not in your, whatever, top three or top five uh, criteria of the customer to decide, you know, it doesn't play in, in, in uh, of course, if you go crazy with the price, yes, of course it will. But typically, I would say, I wouldn't look at win rate. I would look indeed at customer discussions. And I once tried to, tried to buy a company, but that's years ago, Web Expenses. Uh, and they had this whole system where they recorded every call with the customer. They looked at the most, let's say, successful sales deals or sales reps. And they started analyzing. And they could say like, hey, in the ideal case, 
you start talking about competition after 20 minutes, <clears throat> you start talking about this, about whatever features at this, and you only start talking about prices after 45 minutes. And and they 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 build that. Uh, and I think today there are tools like Gong and, and, and others out there which can do that for you. At, at that time, a few years ago, they had done it themselves. Uh, wow. But honestly, uh, and I know, I know, I'm not affiliated with anybody here. You know, there are several solutions in the market, but you have solutions today which are going to plug in into your Teams or Zoom call. We're going to record it, get a transcript. They will, <clears throat> you can filter on keywords. They will give you a breakdown. Uh, you can actually coach your salespeople based on that. And honestly, for me, that's that's pure gold. That's super I mean, powerful. Yeah, I mean, and and well, first of all, <clears throat> sit in and listen to your you know the sales calls or be there. Uh, but from a scalability perspective and and continuous improvement, some of these tools, you know, there is Gong, there is Outreach, there are several of those on the market. I think HubSpot is even trying to integrate it now directly in HubSpot. Something. Oh similar. yeah, you have it everywhere nowadays. And honestly, <laughs> that's that's it's again it's pure statistics, but. If you have enough of these transcripts and you can say like, hey, you know, this sales rep has the highest win rate. Okay, what does he do different? Okay, that that's this. And then, and start playing with it. Start playing with it. Start making, <clears throat> and I know it, it sounds like it's becoming a call center, but start preparing like the ideal scenario. Like you have your first one hour call with a, you know, with a demo and whatever for a, for a customer. Start preparing it. And of course, people can deviate and have their own personal touch. But if you can say to them like, hey, this is like the winning script. And then maybe every quarter you revise it with your salespeople. Like, but I've done this and this works and I've done this. But help them. Help them create the winning script. Um, uh -huh. And honestly, it works. It just works. All right, then. Now we do that. Um, you, you, you already talked a little bit about the... Uh, the belief system that sales reps might have. I mean, the, the entire sales organization might have at the beginning when you want to change prices. Uh, but it's not only that I can imagine. I can imagine it's also about educating the sales rep on how to effectively translate features into uh, valuable deliverables or whatever you want to you wanna name it. So how do you, or at least how did you approach it, the education of the sales team? I think, um, and again, it depends on the maturity of the company. Um, sales should never talk about features unless you're very far into, you know, a discussion with a customer. Uh, but you lead with benefits because at the end, um, look, take SaaS, you know, the typical SaaS environment. Nobody cares if you're doing this with the best most advanced AI, or if you have 100 people sitting in a low country, in a low cost country, doing the work, at the end, the customer buys the result, right? So, oh, we do this, we do that. Uh, yeah, we have the, the best, whatever it is. Great, and what does that mean for the customer? Oh, because you have the best OCI. UI. Yeah, or the, the, or the best UI, that means that, hey, you don't need to train people. They can use the product right away. You have faster time to money. And that that's something you can talk about. But don't assume that your customer translates the features into benefits. You have to do it for them. Um, which means that, you know, you need to train the salespeople, like, what are the key benefits that we deliver? And that means you, again, it's your USP. And then you can get that if you talk to customers like, hey, why did you choose us? So you can focus on that. So yes, you need to train salespeople on that. What has helped me in the past as well, uh, it could be on the website, it could be with an Excel sheet, is having a very simple kind of return on investment calculator. Where as a salesperson, you can ask like, hey, I don't know what, how many employees are you or so much? So you would need so much licenses. How much uh, invoices do you treat in a month? Da, 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 da. Ping, you know, based on the statistics, that means, and you can show them during 
the sales call, you know, or, or they can have it on the web. I know, and they just gave you the figures, you fill them in, and it changes the whole discussion, you know, uh, because... Yeah, a collaborative it, proposal uh, you create that way, kind of. Yeah, and honestly, I've done it in the past with a basic Excel sheet, <clears throat> you know, like, it's nicely tailored and whatever, but you could use something m very much more sophisticated like Showpad or something else, or you have it on your website, and then you just go, well, you need to have a, a wireless connection, just go to the website... If you're sitting with a customer, if it's a Teams call or a Zoom call, it's even easier. And you fill in the figures together, you know, um, even to the point that, um, you know, you get feedback sometimes that because you made that business case together with the prospect and you send it to them, that this made life so much easier for them to defend the project because they didn't have to do calculations. They could just show management, hey, look, no. This is the right. kind of business case, this is the ROI, so, and even before you have the deal, you create a kind of ambassador or sponsor. So, yeah, it's, That's it's good. It's, That's it's one, good. at one hand, it's about, you know, knowing your USPs and, and that's not the feature, it's the benefits you deliver. And if you can, you know, have some basic ROI or whatever calculation where you can ask real time the input from the customer you fill it in together it does wonders because it it really you know makes the benefit tangible like yeah yeah you say you have 200 percent roi but i'm different everyone thinks they're different every company thinks they're different they're not but everyone thinks they're different okay fine you know this is what we've done with previous customers let's go through this together and blah 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 and that and you know you and try it's you, crystal you, clear yeah, you, you, you create buy-in. You make it super tangible, yeah. You make it super mm -hmm. tangible, you create buy-in, you share that file with the, with the customer and, you know, if things go well, that's what they yeah. end up presenting to um, their management. I also wanted to talk to you about discounting because I feel like you cannot talk about price without discount, especially in sales. We are throwing with discounts as sales. What, what's your opinion on that? Should you use it? Should you not? When should you use it? If yes, I mean, what's your opinion on it? I typically don't give discounts without getting anything back. So, uh, and it also depends on, and that takes a bit of experience, but, you know, do you trust the other side? Because I remember a case when it was at Alcatel and we had a, a very big potential deal with KPN, the Dutch telecom operator. And we're talking about 100 millions. And the procurement guy kept on saying like, you're too expensive, you're too expensive, you're too expensive. And we went down and down and down. And then by accident, he shared what well, he shared a PowerPoint and he had done a copy paste of an Excel in there, but he had pasted it as an Excel. So you double click <laughs> and we had the whole no list way. of prices of That's all amazing. the competitors. <laughs> oh yeah. We, we were 40%, we were 40% cheaper than everyone else. And the guy had kept us chasing for weeks to lower the price and we just moved and moved and moved and moved. So it depends also on, you know, who's at the other side. You know, if it's a procurement guy or girl who gets paid to get a lower price, be careful. If it's like a business sponsor, which you can really trust, who says like, yeah, guys, I really like you. And the competition is 20% cheaper and I, I, I have... And then typically the thing is, I have difficulties defending your value. You know, mm. help them defend the value. If you don't get there for whatever reason, you can play on the price. Typically, when I get or when I give, you know, when, you know, when you discuss with the team and you give a discount, you ask something back. Okay, we're going to give you 10% or 15% discount and I want a customer testimonial. Or we're going to give you a discount and that means... I get a, you know, a signed order form before the end of the month. Or, uh, you know, uh, we want to have you speak on our customer event next time or whatever. It doesn't have to be money, but you ask something back. Because the moment you start giving discount without any consequences, they, they're going to keep on asking. They're going to keep on asking. And, and I'm going to give you a stupid example of, of something we, uh, well, I negotiated a few months ago, but Big, big prospect, very big RFQ. Uh, we go in with a T 
decent price. We have a first discussion. We get shortlisted, blah, 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 with our three potential vendors. We have a first meeting with um, with the customer, you know, like on the shortlist and, and, and next steps. Two junior people from uh, from procurement, we say like, you need to drop your price with 50% because the competitor is, you know, much lower. Okay, I know the market. I find that hard to believe. And, and that's what I literally told them. So who is the competition? Oh, we can't tell. Okay, fine, but no 50% discount. And I know that that uh, the young lady managing the account was screaming at me afterwards, like, I want that deal and you're going to make me lose. And I said, no, no, we're not going to give 50% discount. We're going to give 15, one five. And we're not going to be out of the race. And, you know, we're giving them a discount. Why do we give a discount? Because procurement needs to show they're doing their job. We, you know, otherwise, they get upset. But 50% is nuts. And actually, we won the deal at the end, and we had given in total, you know, through all the negotiations, 25% discount, while the customer ask or the procurement ask was they won 50%. We never got to the 50%. Never. And so then, what did you but, ask in exchange? Uh, on the 15%, I asked to have a management meeting with their, uh, you know, senior procurement. Um, and then, you know, when we went down, we asked them like, hey, but we want to have you as a reference customer. And uh, we're talking about three countries. What about the other countries? Okay, but we could, you know, in the next step, add those. Yeah, it's it's about, you know, if, if you give the customer or the prospect the impression that you can give discounts without any consequence, of course, they're going to keep on asking. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that's... I've known cases, uh, and that's typically with American vendors, where the sales are under a lot of pressure to get a deal by the end of the quarter, where you get a 90% discount on the list price if you buy in the last week of the quarter because the sales rep needs to get his quota. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, I mean... 90%. But, you know, if, yeah, yeah, I mean, if, 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 as a, if as a customer, you know what kind of company is on the other side, you can play the game. Well, you know what? If you know your customer and you know your market, you can play the game as well, you know? Um, so it's 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 really understanding like, okay, but what is reasonable? And, and this is a bit based on experience. If somebody comes in and he says like, you know, your customers are at this price, which is like exactly 50% of like, no, 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 no way. You know? it's, it's a bit of an experience, but um, my, my point is you don't give discount without getting anything back. And then it's a bit more on experience. It's reading the situation like, yeah, but of course procurement is going to say you're too expensive. You know, if it's the business owner who says like, I want to work with you and I have an issue. Okay. You can have another discussion. So it's a bit reading the situation and it's, it's a lot about uh, not giving away value for free. You can ask for something else, which is not always money. You know, it can be a testimonial. It can be whatever. Them being a guest speaker, a customer event, uh, a small video clip, whatever it is. That's it. No, that's good. That's good. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that experience, Peter. And I think uh, this was a good, good thing to uh, to end up this conversation with. Maybe if there is like one last thought, one last learning, one last experience, one last advice you would like to share the uh, with the audience, what would that be? I would say dare. Just, just well, to quote Nike, just do it. <clears throat> I wouldn't say. Do it with all of your customers in one shot. Uh, but what I've done in the past is like uh, for the customers who had a, let's say, a, a contract with the online terms and conditions, so not a <clears throat> negotiated contract, you increase the price for 10% of your customer base. And you wait a few weeks, nobody complains, no churn. Okay, next batch, next batch, next batch. So <clears throat> just there to do it. Make sure you understand your customer base. And if you don't feel comfortable, do it in small batches. Try it out. Test it. Test the market. Test your customers. And honestly, yeah. the risk you, you, you know, if, if you say like, hey, for the 10% of the customers, I've increased the price with 20% and I have a 5% a churn, you have a net gain on revenue. Cool. We can go. You know, it's try it out. It's um, just try it. And I like it. I like it. Don't be no, afraid of, of, of doing it. 
That's amazing. Just do it, guys. Just do it bit by bit, iterate, create hypothesis, and uh, make it work. Peter, if um, there is one call to action you want to give, like the audience, maybe, you know, you have like a special ask, a special call to action. Wow. Well, how could you use this platform for? Oh, no, I'm, I'm um, well, I like these kind of things. I've been doing this for the last 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> Uh, and I'm more than happy to help out people, you know, if it's just with some questions or if there is a specific project where I can, you know, a long-term project that that's a bit of a different discussion, but happy to help. Um, I would say hit me up on LinkedIn or whatever uh, and happy to provide feedback. And I would say um, just do it, guys. I mean, uh, if, uh, if the dev and the product guys can get away with agile and, you know, iterative approach on the whole thing, you can do the same thing with sales. So uh, just do it. Hell yeah. And if you don't know what to do, hit me up on LinkedIn or somewhere else and uh, happy to help you out. Perfect. Well, Peter, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Wish you nothing but the best and uh, see you next time. Okay. Thank you much, very much. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here. That's it. We've once again reached the end of an episode. I just really appreciate you all spending the time. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and until next week with a fresh new episode.